My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today, I'm speaking with retired Master Sergeant Roger Sparks. He is the author of Warrior's Creed. Um, I got connected to him. If, if you guys listening uh, have listened to the interview I did with Rudy Reyes, this is the man that he talks about in that interview, um, being one of his mentors, his best friend, his brother. Uh, and Rudy's the one that turned me on to Warrior's Creed. And I, I knew right away after listening uh, to, to some of the audio book, it was like, man, I, I gotta, I definitely gotta talk to this guy. But a little bit more about, about Roger. He, he served in the military as both a recon Marine. So, you know, the special forces for the Marine Corps and an Air Force pararescue man. He, he served in the military for over 25 years, you know, some in the Marines and some in the Air Force. And for those of you that, that aren't familiar with, you know, the pararescue men, the, the PJs, they're the, the special forces of the Air Force. They're the guys that go in, uh, you know, when, when our troops are, are getting ripped up and, and they, they need to get pulled out of combat. Um, so that is actually, uh, I think we're gonna talk a little bit about it, but, but Roger is the recipient of the Silver Star, which is one of our nation's highest awards for valor. Um, he got this award for his actions during a fierce firefight with insurgents in Afghanistan's Wadapur Valley. Um, this happened on November 14th, 2010. This was uh, actually detailed in the Warrior's Creed. Uh, so if you're interested in, in getting some, some details on uh, that, uh, that actual mission, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible, but um, you know, Sparks has transitioned from, from that career of special operations in the military into the civilian world as an artist, an author, and a speaker. He lives with his family in Eagle River, Alaska. And, you know, this artist side of you, I guess, comes from your mother, but you, I, I guess, based on what you say in the book, you really re-embraced that side of yourself when you got introduced to the tattoo artists. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I guess I've always been an artist, uh, you know, my entire adult life. Um, I guess, you know, my going back to my earliest years, you know, I was always that kid that would be drawing and sketching. Um, you know, I was, I was a little bit aloof. I was, I was very much so into... Uh, being physical, like I played all the sports when I was a kid. Um, I mean, it was a much different time. And I grew up in the 70s. And, uh, you know, I grew up riding dirt bikes without helmets and crashing and getting concussions and, you know, just walking it off. Um, I mean, up until the point that I, I, you know, graduated high school, I figured I'd broken every long bone in my body just from doing daredevil activities you know, doing kickboxing on trampolines and, you know, just a uh, pretty, pretty vigorous childhood, I guess. But uh, I was always, uh, I was always fascinated by art. I mean, from watching Bob Ross on PBS to watching my mother uh, paint uh, in the backyard. Uh, she was an oil painter and, and uh, really good with graphite, you know, with pencils and stuff and sketches. And she was always taking art classes and, um, 
uh, even my father with his kind of rugged demeanor, he was a photographer, you know, and he, he loved taking photos and there was always art books around the house, you know, mixed in with hustlers and, you know, like smut mags. It was just a really open household that I grew up in. And again, I mean, it was a completely different time. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, those those early formative years were, I guess, extreme free range. You know, like I would, I would ride dirt bikes to uh, the mall, you know, and ditch my dirt bike, you know, in a culvert in a ditch and then go steal Motley Crue tapes at the at the local mall and then jump back on my dirt bike and ride back home and hang out, you know, with my friends. And, you know, it was a time of, uh, you know, we'd have BB gun wars, you know, shooting each other with BB guns. And for fun, we'd go swimming in creeks and and uh, swim out. There's this one creek in particular, we'd swim out in the middle of it with uh, sticks and smash up water moccasin nests and swim away as fast as we could. And when we got on shore, we would try to kill the snakes that were chasing us with rocks. You know, so it was a pretty free range, pretty open environment that I was coming from. But, uh, you know, looking back on it, I mean, I was always fascinated with art and expression. Uh, you know, there's always poetry books laying around, uh, you know, where I grew up. But I guess I've always just felt things deeply. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that I was overly sensitive, but I always felt things very deeply. And, uh, you know, you mentioned my book, Warrior's Creed, and, uh, you know, at a young adolescent age, I experienced uh, a lot of difficulty with uh, knee pain, and that ended up being a tumor in my left knee. And I think that amongst other experiences that I'm sure we're going to get into, I mean, that, that single event was probably one of the most formative things of my, my life, just with dealing with uh, injustice and pain. Uh, and loss of innocence and uh, just life's hard, man. I mean, anybody that wants to paint peaches and cream or was raised in, in this insulated world, that was not what I'm coming from. And we didn't have insurance and I had knee pain to the point where I couldn't walk. And uh, about a year, year and a half, two years into this through my adolescence, uh, uh, it was found out that I had a tumor in my knee and they were going to do surgery on that. And uh, the doctor told me that uh, the oncologist, the, the oncologist surgeon was telling me that uh, I have a 50-50 chance of waking up without my leg. And I was 15 years old. They didn't know if I had cancer or not. They were going to do a biopsy on the table. But it was a golf ball-sized tumor on the side of my knee. And uh, I remember he told me that. And I was like, well, I was like, well, fuck it, man. If if that's the case, I'm going to be one badass, one-legged dude, you know. And uh, I mean, this is 15 years old, you know. And and uh, I got a uh, question for you, man, because like so much of like your childhood and mine was it's very similar. Like, what year were you born? Uh, 1972, early 70s, you know. It, and yeah, yeah, yeah I, was, I was 74. You know, the BMX craze. Yeah, Atari, man. Yeah. Uh, Atari. Um, you know, I was a runner and a wrestler in high school. I I broke my leg and uh, developed compartment syndrome. Almost, yeah. almost lost my leg. So, like, yeah. there's, like, I, I don't want to compare my childhood with yours because, you know, what you share in the book um like you were introduced to a whole different like subculture of the united states and uh yeah i mean I, you know it's like it's always thin ice to tread with people when you start comparing trauma or difficulty in your lives and i know that's not what you're, you're trying to do uh but i just want to say that for the viewers you know like minimizing your own personal trauma by comparing it to someone else's is really a, a horrible road to go down you know and it yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, what you're alluding to is, you know, my father was a biker. He was a enforcer in a very violent, um, uh, a very violent culture. And he was one of the guys that was there to project that violence and, and, uh, growing up around that, uh, you know, my, my father was never abusive to, to, uh, my sister or I, or my mother. Uh, but, uh, 
he was uh, he was a pit bull man. He had a very quick fuse around uh, you know other men or people within his peer group. He was very very aggressive with them, you know. And uh, you know, I witnessed my father get in uh, numerous uh, mortal contests with other men, you know, that were not uh, you know it wasn't. Uh, wasn't like a, a just a fight it was it was you know it was like a language of of uh of violence that that I was around that that uh, I just respected it you know I mean I did grow up around uh dog fighting you know I grew up around you know very uh illicit drugs uh you know just uh around me all the time and uh you know, a lot of the, the, the other men that helped shape my life, these guys were all Vietnam veterans. These guys were guys that uh, were not just Vietnam veterans, they were Vietnam combat veterans, you know, that served in combat units. And uh, they came back from their experiences at war uh, in Southeast Asia, and they, they couldn't identify with the cultures around them. And so they chose to, you know, live the rest of their lives outside of the confines of the law. And, and uh, I think that uh, that really instilled this deep romanticism in me of the romance of combat or the illusion that we live in in this Western culture. I mean, like you said, we grew up in the same time, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you know, I mean, um, it was it, it obviously wasn't what it is today but man it's things have gotten so sensitive over the last 20 or 30 years i mean even being in the military i saw that you know you mentioned in the introduction i spent 25 years in the military and in large part i was insulated from all the bullshit of the world i mean to to operate in a tier 1 unit within the military you don't deal with a lot of the the bureaucratic or, or public correctness that the rest of the military deals with you know because it's a thing of necessity right like like it's not it's i forget which there was a famous quote about armies there's some kind of frenchman and he was talking about there's i wish i could have two militaries one that is all polished brass and and parade and the other one that's just you know, meat eater killers that are not uh, to be trifled with. You know, they're, they're not the guys that, that uh, are following the rules per se, but they're the guys that you want, you know, in, in, in the worst of the circumstances. And I did surround myself with those guys, you know, and um, again, in my adult world and adolescence, one of my father's best friends was a guy named Jack Gaylor. And Jack Gaylor was a corpsman uh, with, uh, Vietnam combat experience within Marine infantry platoons. And uh, he would just tell me stories of his experiences. And I would just see in him, I mean, this guy was a bear of a guy. I mean, I'm six foot nine. This guy was at least six foot nine. I mean, to me, in my young age, he seemed 10 feet tall, you know, but he was a bear of a human, you know, I mean, just he wore like a leather vest and he would break out where he wore his flak jacket, he'd break out in like red hives, you know, where he would wear, because he got sprayed with defoliant. I mean, just all of these cliche things of Vietnam combat veterans, he was every one of them, but he was larger than life. And through his storytelling and through me just being so impressionable at that time, it really instilled in me that there, the things within popular secular culture specifically western culture are are a lot and we have far more in us than you can possibly understand or anyone can teach you you have to learn those things through your own experience and you know i decided at, at you know a young adolescent age that i would join the military and i would get into marine reconnaissance because i felt that that could teach me the most I would want to learn about life, about myself, about spirituality, about physicality, about aggression, about love, all those kind of human conditions. I, I thought that that would be my alma mater, you know, that, that would be my, my master's degree in humanity. And uh, I mean, that was from, I mean, that was a very conscious thing. Like I decided that I wanted, I, I would write things to myself, you know, when I, when I was recovering from that knee injury that I mentioned, you know, like I would, I would write, I, I would read books incessantly, you know, I mean, 
and I would read yoga books. I would go and steal books from the library on yoga. And I'm 16 years old, man, you know, and I always felt like I was less than or I was weaker because of this injury that I'd experienced. And so I was always trying to understand how to improve my own vitality. And uh, and again, you pair that with, you know, the. I guess, metaphoric poetry of of combat veteran discussion. And it was like, I need to get in special operations, period. You know, I need to understand this because I want to be, you know, and then you can you can uh, relate to this. Too. We grew up around Star Wars. Right. You know, so it's like uh, I mean, I remember seeing the first three Star Wars, the, the original trilogy, like at the drive in, man, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it, it was so impressionable on me. I would I would sit around and try to like levitate rocks with my mind, you know, and and just even though I'd only seen maybe say, you know, like, for instance, like Empire Strikes Back with with the whole Yoda and all that stuff, you know, maybe I'd only seen that like two times I could recite the whole thing, you know, and I was just so into it, but it really struck a chord. And, uh, you know, and I know that, you know, and this is in hindsight now, you know, whenever George Lucas was developing all that, you know, he was a student of Joseph Campbell's and Joseph Campbell is really big on Greek mythology, you know, the, the hero's journey. And uh, whether or not I was aware of it or not, I was just, I was hardwired to go into the military and make things larger than life, like to create my own reality within that medium. And uh, I joined, you know, I joined the, the Marine Corps, uh, became an infantryman, spent two years in the infantry. And uh, I was afraid they weren't gonna take me because I had to get a waiver for the knee surgery that I had done. And uh, this was a really intense, invasive knee surgery, you know, um, you know, just, you know, for instance, the doctor told me I'd never walk normal again. Uh, this tumor had eaten away my MCL. And at the time, uh, it was a very uh, explorative surgery to replace my MCL with a cadaver's MCL. And I mean, again, this is, you know, I'm just trying to think, you know, you think if this happened in the 80s, you know, like how many years ago? I mean, that's I mean, it's a long time ago. And, and uh, you know, medicine was not what it is now, you know. Um, but uh, it was a very long road to recovery. And uh, at the time, the only thing I could do to recover from that surgery was to join like a weightlifting gym, like a bodybuilding powerlifting gym. And uh, again, I just you know, I was like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to learn everything I can about this bodybuilding and weightlifting and all these things. And the gym that I worked out, out in was in Dallas with Ronnie Coleman, you know, with, with these guys. I mean, this was like a steroid freak scream gym, you know, and, uh, uh, that's where I learned, uh, about my body, about my physicality and about overcoming weakness, you know, and, and, uh, um, in fact, when my wife and I got married, uh, I'm still married to my prom date. You know, we went to the prom together. You know, been married 27, 28 years now. And, and uh, um, the best man at my wedding was the owner of that gym. You know, I mean, that's how into it I was. You know, so it's like, um, I don't know. I just, I've always had this gritty way of just really trying to cut to the heart of everything, whether it's being an infantryman in the Marine Corps or lifting weights or, doing poetry or painting or tattooing, whatever it is. Like, I, I feel like I just, I pour acid on myself and it just, it, it just eats away all the bullshit. And it, I try to take things right to the bone marrow, you know, with everything I do. Um, but with my Marine Corps experiences at the time to be a, a reconnaissance Marine, you had to spend two years in the infantry before you could try out to be reconnaissance. And, uh, so I did my time, uh, but again, just a uh, for instance, I remember when I talked to my platoon sergeant. You know, when you get into an infantry platoon, this is the real military. This isn't you're not some pogue clerk or you're not doing. This is very real military. Like when you show up, it, it's corporal punishment is a very real thing. Um, it's it's very Spartan in the fact that there's 30 guys and they all are held to this very strict code of conduct and a very brutal uh demeaning atmosphere 24 7 you know and and uh, you got to know how to carry yourself 
And uh, the way I, I described it, my son, he's actually a Marine grunt right now, my older son. Uh, it's just like the movie Cool Hand Luke. You know, like if you were to take a chain gang and put it in the military, that is a Marine infantry platoon, you know. And uh, I remember when I met my platoon sergeant the first time, he asked me, he's like, so what are your goals in the Marine Corps, you know? I was like, oh, I'm going to be a reconnaissance Marine and make a career out of that. And he just laughed, you know, because that was like saying, I want to be an astronaut, you know, and because, and, you know, within the Marine Corps reconnaissance and now MARSOC, you know, and still reconnaissance as well is held with such high regard because everybody in the Marine Corps understands combat arms. They understand, they truly understand the infantrymen and, and, uh, uh, to say now I want to be the tier one MVP of the Marine Corps, everybody's like, yeah, good luck, buddy. But uh, two years from the date that, that I met him and got into my first infantry platoon, I was in reconnaissance. And uh, man, my religion was reconnaissance. You know, like if I had to give, for instance, a class, I was just speaking with Rudy about this uh, uh, a week ago. Uh, one of the first classes I ever gave as a Marine reconnaissance instructor was this class on the tides, uh, the tide tables and tidal current vectors. Because before, this is before GPS, and you would have to read the tidal charts. And, you know, you being from the Navy, you understand this is a very in-depth thing. These tidal, these tidal charts were like the, the thickness of a phone book, and they would depending on the latitude and longitude at a specific date and time, there'd be like this farmer's almanac that would forecast exactly what the tides will be doing at this specific geographic location, at this Latin long, at this date and time on earth, you know? And it was produced every year. Now it's all just digital and, and all this stuff. But at the time, you had to learn how to do these current vector triangles. Like if you were gonna helicast a Zodiac out of the back of a, a CH-53 or CH-46, and you were gonna drive that Zodiac 20 miles open ocean to land on a beach at a specific point on the beach, you needed to time that exactly at high tide. So when you carried yourself or you walked across that beach with your reconnaissance team, you'd leave no footprints. Because as that high tide was there, the, the tide would go back and there's no trace that you're ever there. And so not only do you need to be able to navigate precisely, you know, with a simple compass and your zodiac and your wits and your thoughts and time and distance and speed and all this in celestial bodies and all this stuff. Not only do you need to be able to do that, but you need to know exactly what the tides are doing at that specific location. And so this was shamanism, man. I mean, this was metaphysical shamanism. And I am here to train warriors that are willing to die doing whatever I tell them to do. And not only that, they're some of the most highly selected individuals within the military. And so you have this apex of human potential and you have this sacred sorcery craft of understanding the tide tables and all this, using the, the, the metaphysics of the universe of the earth to be elusive or be lethal with those forces. And I just, that was my religion. And it was to my religion to the point that I got into mysticism uh, and shamanism uh, with chicken bones and reading in intuition with people. And so uh, I got uh, a name for myself by training young Marines to become reconnaissance Marines. And at the time, you would have to go to two places to get the military occupational specialty of reconnaissance Marine. You would have to either go to a basic reconnaissance course or you'd have to go to amphibious reconnaissance school. And that's just the same school, the same uh, thing, but it was East Coast, West Coast, depending on where you would go. And I was giving, I was given the, uh, the power to bestow the 0321, the Marine reconnaissance title on Marines. They would carry the rest of their career by running them through a course that I set up and I would run over a six month period. And I took that stuff very, very seriously. And uh, I mean, I, I feel I was extremely successful. I mean, even when you look at, uh, I mean, using Rudy as an example, like he was one of the uh, outcomes of those programs. Uh, I mean, other men, uh, there's another guy named A.J. Hull. He is the, uh, uh, the Sergeant Major of MARSOC. 
And I mean, these guys, I, I put through those programs and developed them as, as young reconnaissance Marines. And uh, it was as Eastern as, and as mystic as I could get away with. And, and uh, it was as brutal and, and as serious and reverent, I think, as something can be. And, uh, and I know I, I skipped way ahead in, in a lot of stuff, but I just kind of went off on this, uh, the, this, this crazy leg of, of my life. But I guess I just felt I had to kind of explain my connection with Rudy in yeah. some way. But yeah, no. So I, I was going to, I was going to talk about that where, where you guys met was when he came through your school as one of your students and how you talk about him in your book is so freaking cool because he holds you in such high regard as well. It's, I don't know, to, to hear him talk about you and then to, to listen to your book and hear you talk about him. <laughs> two two badass motherfuckers man like and and you're you're so uh in tune with one another and you talk about it in the book where you know he he studied kung fu and um you know he had a sifu and was taught you know different eastern philosophy and and he was the one that introduced you to the warrior's creed right or to uh the hagakuri yeah, not not Warriors Creed, but you know, I know that you're just referring to the book, and and I'm using the the, the term Warriors Creed there. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, I've been in the Marine Corps probably six years. Uh, so I was like four years as a reconnaissance Marine. You know, like jump school, dive school, SEER school. You know, multiple deployments, and then they gave me. Uh, uh, they just knew that I was adept at teaching people. And so I got very involved in, in uh, developing reconnaissance Marines. And, and uh, Rudy was already, Rudy had gone through the program. He was already like an 0321, like the title of a reconnaissance Marine, but you still had to go through my course just to check your butter a little bit, you know, just to make sure that you were legit. And I would run also courses that were called pre scubas, which is the most feared thing within uh, the Marine culture of like a, being a young reconnaissance Marine is going through a pre scuba. And uh, you basically get drowned every day and, and uh, PT to death. And this is where, you know, you read about in my book where I had guys, you know, they would fill their mouth with water and we'd go on, you know, like 10 mile runs, you know, at like a blistering pace. And at the end of it, if you couldn't spit the water out, well, then there was absolute you know, horror to be, you know, delved out on you and your teammate because you didn't have the discipline to just hold that water in your mouth, you know, and, and uh, uh, Rudy went through that program at the time, but yeah, Rudy and I are definitely a bit of like a self-licking ice cream cone, you know, <laughs> you know, but uh, it, uh, it's, there's no contrivedness about it, you know, I mean, I was, again, I was a senior instructor and he was a young you know, reconnaissance Marine when we met, but I just, I saw extreme value in him. I saw extreme potential. Uh, and there was a very strong kinship, you know, you know, he has a gravity to him and some people can handle it and some people can't, you know, and, and uh, we were just thick as thieves, man, just peas and carrots. You know, we would, for fun, we would go and do the, the uh, uh, escape from Alcatraz triathlon. At the time I was on the Marine Corps triathlon team and we would just go up there and do that for fun, you know, and, and uh, uh, just, you know, just stuff like that all the time, you know, um, we were, again, I was with him last week, uh, you know, we're part of an organization I'm sure we're going to get to, it's called Force Blue, and, and uh, it's a program that, uh, that it was his idea with a couple other guys, and then again, just synchronicity or serendipity being what it is, um, we met up in Brooklyn, I was tattooing at a tattoo shop in Brooklyn, and uh, I agreed to, to jump in on the, the ground floor of this thing called Force Blue, and, and uh, that was about 10 years ago now, but uh, we were just in Florida teaching an ocean conservation school to Gold Star children. So, you know, families of fallen service members, we were teaching their kids uh, how to dive, 
and also uh, the basics of ocean conservation and kind of welcoming them into the forest blue family and super powerful stuff, man, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, man, I love me some Rudy. I, I know when we, you and I were first speaking, you know, I kind of said the same thing, but uh, uh, you know, there's just certain people in your life that you really click with. And uh, I don't know if it's the kinship is probably based on maybe, you know, just the difficulties we faced when we were kids and uh, the fact that um, we project a reality. Like I'm willing to create my reality, man. You know, um, you know, I want to will the world that I want into being, you know, and, and, and I, I'm willing to take that and hide to do that. And I think that's where Rudy and I really have kinship. You know, like if, if someone can do a 50 meter underwater, I can do a hundred meter underwater. If they can do a hundred meter underwater, I can do a 200 meter underwater, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just, those are the things that, uh, and I can will myself to do that. You know, I think just that, that propensity to explore human potential, you know, at a psychological level, it kind of transcends itself into the physical realm, you know, and, and, uh, I think that's where we really have kinship and, and, uh, you know, just watching Cirque du Soleil, you know, and being like, that is like performance art, but it's also physical performance, you know, and, and we applied that same concept to special operations, you know. Um, but yeah, man. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I did, uh, you know, 12 years in the Marine Corps, and I transitioned from the Marine Corps into pararescue. Um, yeah, I just, uh, there's so much to unpack with all this stuff man i mean i don't i don't even know where you want to take it but uh i'll shut up and let you ask questions man <laughs> now, so <clears throat> one of the things that i i found really interesting in your book was when when rudy w was one of your students and you guys started while well, you you recognized this spirituality that you each had. Um, and I find it pretty interesting how you were able to recognize and apply that, uh, that almost kind of mystic um, mental I don't even know what you would call it. Uh, you, you you were developing these these individuals to be like able to do the impossible, and and a lot of it, yeah, they're they're physically fit, but the the mind game is so much more important. Yeah, yeah, and, and I always thought that. Uh you know, the mind is our limitation, right? Like, I mean, whatever you perceive your reality to be becomes like this prison to you, you know, and it's, it's a, it's a malleable thing. Like the thing, the world around us is malleable with our will. And, uh, you know, like, like, for instance, like the SAS, you know, the British SAS, the, the, the UK special operations guys, you know, like they have this saying, he who dares wins. And that's right. Like whether you think you can or you can't, you're both true. I mean, these are all just sappy, you know, kind of things that have, you know, run through our culture, but there's, there's an innate truth to that, that I just, I really love experiencing uh, that on a daily basis. I mean, I mean, I'm 50 years old now and, and almost every day, like every other day, we, uh, we sauna and ice bathe, you know, and, and uh, it's just, I like touching the void of my perceptive reality, you know, and whether that's working out, whether that's, uh, uh, you know, doing art, whether that's uh, just speaking with people. I like to explore what's at the edges, you know, not the, not the, hey, how's the weather, man? You know, how are you doing? You know, I, I really dislike, I have a disdain for mediocrity, you know, like I, and I don't know where that comes from. Maybe it was just the violence that I was around or just the extreme nature in which I was raised, um, but I just, I, I really dislike that. And I think that's one of the things that attracted me to tattooing is you can't posture your way through that shit. Like, 
you know, you want to come to me and you want me to do a sleeve or something like that. Well, it's okay. I mean, we could talk about it all you want, but at some point you're going to sit down and I'm going to tattoo you, you know, for six hours or 10 hours or 12 hours. And then you're going to go to sleep. I'm going to do it again. You know, and, and I like the fact that uh, there's, there's a lack of posturing in that. And I think that's what I really like in uh, within special operations. You know, there's a lot of showboaters out there. There's a lot of people that flex and, uh, but, you know, when you experience combat, you know, like when you really see what the, the Vietnam veterans that I grew up with, they called that, you know, have you seen the tiger smile? You know, like when you see violence, you know, in an essence, breathing at you when it's, you know, that tiger's looking right at you, you know, and, and um, I like the sincerity of that. You know, there's quotes like there, there's, you know, there, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Well, I want to explore that. I want to know what that feels like. And, and I want I can say with conviction, I think that's bullshit. You know, I, I, you know what I'm saying? I, I like, I like that, you know, I like yeah. the edges of it all, you know, the, the, the lunatic fringe of it, you know, uh, because I think that's where we find truth and honesty. And it's almost as if I've, I've tried to go through my entire life to just whittle it all down. You know, I guess in an exploration to find my own meaning, I, I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, you know, on top of this, you know, uh, you know, a big part of my life now, you know, just like any father or husband, you know, I've, I've got two boys. And so I mentioned my oldest son is in the Marine Corps as an infantryman. And my youngest son, uh, he is special needs. So uh, he has cerebral palsy. Uh, he's nonverbal and he's got type one diabetes. And he's 18 years old, and that dude is a stud, man. I mean, all we work out every day for two hours, rain, shine, sleep, 40 below. We'll take kettlebells out in this field that we live in right out here and just jack steel for two hours, you know. And, uh, you know, like those guys are a big part of my life. And, and, you know, I guess to explore, you know, my son Oz a little bit, when he was four months old, I was, I was paralyzed. I was paralyzed from a, a very traumatic parachuting accident. Um, uh, and I just had surgery and, uh, you know, uh, I, I had just come home, like literally the day that I had surgery, my, my mom and dad, my wife and my kids were in this home in on-base housing and they were unpacking all of our, our move stuff. And, and, uh, I'm literally on a futon that my father just built and I can't walk. I mean, I was paralyzed for three months and, and, uh, um, I was supposed to be completely bedridden, you know, for at least a week and then do another checkup and this and that. And uh, that same day, uh, we went to wake up my son Oz from a nap and uh, we found him in the crib. I was, you know, comatose, you know, on the futon, whacked out of my brain on Oxycontin, you know, after the surgery. And um, my younger son Oz was found, no breathing, no pulse, you know, completely cyanotic or blue. And he was run down to me. And he's like, Rod, my, my father said to me, Rod, something's wrong with Oz. And he's handed him to me. And he was blue. He was lifeless. And I did CPR on him for, you know, if I did CPR on him for 10 minutes, I did it to him for, you know, 30 minutes. You know, I mean, it's, it's uh, that was very traumatic. And so that injury that I recovered from uh, with the paralysis, as well as the anoxic injury that my son uh, took, you know, he, he and I are kind of like this same dude, right? You know, so it's like he and I working out every day together and just exploring that. I've been, I've been approached by other parents with kids with cerebral palsy or, or, you know, special needs kids. And they're like, man, I don't know what you're doing with Oz, man, but damn, like that guy is a unicorn and he's a stud. Like, I mean, he has obviously an anoxic brain injury, but I mean, the dude can do 20 pull-ups, you know, I mean, and he's got ataxia, you know, he, he does have, you know, you can tell that he, he has muscle spasticity, but he's a beast, man. And he, he's so happy to just be present. Uh, he's so happy to just be involved. And uh, uh, it's just, he, he's definitely one of the center points in my life, but he and I like our our subconscious kind of intertwined at that, that point of not only my trauma, but his trauma. And um, uh, yeah, that's, I don't, I don't know why, but when we were talking about it, it's just, just 
you know, the severes are touching the edges of reality all the time. It's like, I'm always around my son Oz. And so that kind of forces that, that exploration, I think, you know, like it, it, it kind of sets the tone of every day. I mean, like last night I slept maybe three hours because his insulin pump was messed up and we had to replace these sensors and his blood sugar was like 400 for like three hours, you know? And so I'm trying to get it down and then I over gave him too much insulin and now he's crashing. He's at like a 40 BGL and I've happened to give him, you know, like oranges and shit. And this is all at three in the morning, you know, and, and that's my reality. That is the reality of every day of my life. You know, when I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm staring at my phone because I'm looking at a Bluetooth transceiver that shows his blood glucose, you know, because um, he's, he's at therapy right now. And so my reality I don't know what normal is, and I don't think I've ever known what normal was. And uh, I definitely feel like I have a master's degree in human suffering, not only receiving it, but but projecting it as well. Um, and I would I would be willing to say, you know, I mean, I'm very quick to my emotion now. You know, I think that that tenderness comes from pain, and uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, throughout my life, you know, I'm definitely connecting with my emotions and and attempting to I guess find balance or resolution from the experiences of my life uh but uh yeah man it's just I guess I just felt it very important Dave to bring up my son Oz because he's he's a huge part of my you know future and, and present and adult life you know in the way that I think about things you know you know but uh yeah no I I, I knew that this conversation with you was going to be profound and, and deep and i i knew that we would dig in, in into some philosophy um one of the things I, i'd like to wait until the end of our conversation to to get your answer but i one of the things that i want to ask you is what you believe the most important thing you've learned in your life is and when when we're we're talking and and i keep on thinking about your book and the experiences that you've had in your life and um <clears throat> i i told you that there was a couple of uh spots in your book where um so i i drive uh, back and forth from orlando to panama city it's a five and a half hour drive so i listen to a lot of audio books and and, you know, I spent 23 years in the fire service, uh, working in the busiest fire stations that I could work in, because that's where the action is. Um, I was the chief of special operations for my department for three years. I, the, the descriptions of rescues that you did as a as a pj um in alaska there the the those civilian rescues where you interact with the family um i i don't have combat experience that's a whole other beast uh but i think when you have witnessed that that anguish the the heard that that like guttural cry that people when when it's like their soul is breaking when they've lost somebody they love and you you did a really good job of uh i don't know painting that picture in in my i had to pull over um, <laughs> like it was well, it was very powerful and i i ended up um i ended up crying for for one of the people that you you talk about in your book and um yeah and it happened years ago and but it, it's just it's that powerful and 
I actually had to stop listening to it because um, it was it was like, man, I, I don't know it, what's coming next. I don't want to <laughs> start crying again. So, so uh, I, I eventually did finish it. And now I'm on on the second time, and it's just such a powerful book. And that that spiritual side of you, um, there there's something different. Uh, I think when when somebody has experienced trauma, been through trauma, been the person that is responsible for bringing somebody back from a traumatic event and even not being able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, there's... it changes you and it's up to us to make sure that that change is a positive one. And with the things that you're doing and how you share your story and just, I mean, you have this phenomenal story. Um, I've met a couple of other uh, individuals that have, uh, receive the silver star and and every one of them you know very very humble um it, it's very interesting to me just I, I talk to a lot of people but to talk to individuals that you know have this full life and an appreciation for it, even with all of the shit that has come with it. Um, and so, like, I, I, I wanted to touch on the whole PTSD side of things because a, a lot of um, my listeners are combat vets or, you know, veterans of the fire service or law enforcement. and you know, have seen, uh, I've seen some shit. And a lot of times in, in those, in those cultures, it's not easy to say, I need to get some help. And, um, and I, I just like knowing that you've had your struggles and that you've found a way to, to be able to help other people still. Um, like, yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, you know, I really feel that, you know, tenderness comes from pain, you know, like, like, when you're the one that's getting kicked in the teeth, you know, not necessarily the one that's doing the kicking, like you, you realize how painful it is, you know, and, and uh, you know, you're, you're definitely, you, man, you talked about a lot of things, man, right there, Dave, that, that's, there's a lot to unpack with everything you just kind of were skirting there, you know, and, you know, life is meant to be lived, you know, and, and life is unfair, man, you know, that, that's, that's the bottom line, and if you have ability, the more life that you experience, the the more that you realize you have to champion others, you know, like we talked a little bit about it yesterday on the phone. I truly believe that to heal ourselves, we have to heal others. You know, whether if you find an organization or you find someone, just even someone that lives on your block that needs help or through online or social media, you can find people that, you know, that, that need assistance. You know, that's where you see this huge stuff right now with the whole Ukrainian thing or the whole BLM movement, or just anything, when you see injustice that is taking place, you know, it's healing to take part in attempting to champion those causes. And, uh, you know, the more personal we can make that, the more individual we can make that, the more meaningful that is for yeah. us. And it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it, 
it's difficult because as that combat veteran or as that person in pain, you become very cynical and you don't want to hear those things because we've all heard it before. Uh, you asked me earlier, you know, what is some of the most powerful lessons that I've experienced? And I mean, immediately, I mean, there's, there's things that it just immediately come to mind. And one is, you know, the story has never mattered. You know, our individual stories have never mattered, only the emotions. You know, it's like, so when, you know, we all know those guys, maybe it's from the firehouse, you know, your, your, your years and decades of, of, you know, work in civil service or whatever it was. We all know these people, all your listeners that are listening right now. We've all, we all know those people. Maybe we've seen it in ourselves that they just tell stories, you know, and it's all details on this date. I was here. And then, you know, we killed this many guys or this many guys died, or, you know, it was this alarm fire and, and so many engine companies were there, just whatever, man. Those stories have never mattered, only the emotions. Try telling that story again and only talking about your emotions. We got alerted to this thing, and I was really scared. We went in. As we were going in, one of my buddies died, you know, on this thing. And I was kind of, I was scared to admit it, but I was glad he died and not me. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's the emotions that matter, not the story. Don't get hung up in the story. And there's a really beautiful quote in Zen Buddhism, and it's the finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. You know, and it's, it's we get so hung up on, you know, the peripheral bullshit that doesn't matter. Connect with the emotion and connect with the, 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 the world around you and connect with, you know, the emotions of others. Like, that's what matters, not the story. And I think that's maybe one of the evils of social media and the world that we live in this in this technological era, because the medium really just amplifies story or narrative. It has nothing to do with the emotion, you know, I mean, in true connection. And so, you know, I, I just think that, uh, you know, that that quote, you know, the story has never mattered, only the emotion. I, that's really powerful. And that can be taken out of context. I get it's not like this, this something that needs to be written in the Bible or something, but to me, that was very powerful because, you know, we get so caught up in the severity of our own stories. Like I can try to explain to you what happened in Bulldog Bite through my eyes. I can try to do that. And I think I did a, a pretty brilliant job in the book. It was brutally as honest as I can. And, uh, but the thing that's difficult about it, I think the thing that that's difficult for people that experience trauma, whether that's combat or surviving domestic violence, whatever it might be, whatever it's, your words will always fall short of articulating the horror that we experience or the loss or the grief that we experience just by living. Like I said, you know, life has injustice, you know, the, the, the cost of life, the cost of breathing this freedom in our lungs every day to be able to stand there and watch the sun rise and set to have this ability. It has a cost and the world is a violent, unforgiving place, you know, and, and we're insulated by that through Western culture. You know, and we think that we, there's all these lies that we're, we're dealt that, that that comfort means success. Comfort is slow death, man. Like there, there is nothing about comfort that is good or successful. That's the, 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 the decay of your success is when you become comfortable. And and we need to stop telling ourselves, you know, like we grew up in the same time, Dave. So it's like, you know, like yo MTV raps or MTV cribs or some bullshit. Like you think that having a luxurious lifestyle is my goal. Like, I want to be comfortable. I want to be sitting on a beach in the Caribbean drinking a Mai Tai. You know, is that comfortable to you? Is that comfortable enough? Because it's a lie. You know, to experience that comfort, you know, you are expressing or, or projecting discomfort on other things. Like the world, again, there, there's injustices that are taking place. But where is growth? Growth is in discomfort. Having that really uncomfortable conversation with a loved one, uh, looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, I expect more out of myself. You know, growth is discomfort. Think of all the times in our lives that we've, we've, we've been in a dark place. That's merely, you know, the snake shedding its skin. That's merely uh, us experiencing growth. Whenever we're, I mean, like when we work out and you start tasting that blood or you can only do so many push-ups and you're on the last few reps or, that right there is growth. 
And that's where you want to put yourself every day. Now, you can't maintain that, right? There's no way you can maintain that. It ebbs and flows, just like those tidal current charts we were talking about. There's ebbs and flows of that, you know? But you need to strive to put yourself in uncomfortable places because we're so lulled into this lie. Uh, but, and I know I'm off on a tangent. The, the other thing I was thinking about, Dave, whenever we were talking, uh, you mentioned, you know, th- lessons learned. Um, I've, I've been asked, uh, after my experiences with Bulldog Bite and that whole Silver Star thing, and, and again, a, a Silver Star are trying to place, whether it's the Medal of Honor, the Silver Star, or a Merit Badge, it doesn't matter because when you resolve yourself to death in attempting to save someone else or perform a certain activity, what other severity is there? Right? I mean, at some point, you just have survivor's guilt or grief from living through those experiences. Like, uh, you know, should I have gotten the Medal of Honor or should I have gotten a Bronze Star? Or, you know, it, it's like when you're really there, you realize as far as awards go, some did less. And I, I'm quoting uh, uh, Tim O'Brien. He's an author that wrote The Things They Carried, which is a brilliant Vietnam War uh, memoir. Uh, but he states in, in one of his books, and it, there's nothing true, he's like, the only thing that you can say about high-level military awards is some did less, you know, some did less and received more, and some did more and received less. And it's, it's how do you rate the severity of risking your life and resolving yourself to death, you know? And, and uh, that was something that I, I really struggled with after my experiences was if they were even real, like they're just so horrific. Is it, am I imagining that or am I making it something more than it was? And I think that's when you, when you alluded to PTSD, it, it, you get really pushed into this spirit world of reality and subconscious. And, and uh, because it doesn't make rational sense that we would live through certain experiences like how does someone else die and I don't and I'm right next to them and then that happens three or four times over a three-hour period or over an eight-day period you know and you can't consciously understand that and so your subconscious gets stuck like a broken record just replaying these events and you get stuck trying to unpack it and understand it but you can't and uh that's where, you know, when I talk about the story never mattered, only the emotion, you know, like when you connect with your emotion, because for so many years, whether it's civil service, whether it's uh, special operations, uh, military experiences, whatever it, it may be, you know, facing that, that mortal level that us as human beings, like we experience that. I mean, none of us are going to live forever, but living through situations where others have not, it forces you to disassociate. And, and you know this as well as I do within, you know, service, like you disassociate your emotions from your actions. Like my emotions have no space on the X. Like, you know, whether it's that I'm trying to relate it, you know, because I'm talking to you and I know that you're, 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 you're very, you know, history and experienced firefighters. So it's like when you're at that fire, like your emotions don't matter. Like you have to be very pragmatic and you make decisions. Same thing in, in special operations and combat. Like I might be flying in and I watch my buddy's helicopters crash into the ground. 30 guys inside. They're all my best friends. My emotion has no place right there. It's very pragmatic in what you're doing, you know, and, and uh, you know, I've had many men die in my arms and that's a horrific thing. And you can subconsciously tell yourself that it's not your fault, but you're implicated in their death because they're begging for their lives to you. And, and that, that's something that's very human as, as a human being, the only way through processing those events is through emotion, through connecting with your emotions. And uh, that's very difficult when I've spent 25 years of my entire adult life disassociating from my emotional content. Um, you know, where it really hit home for me is I came home from that deployment. And as an Alaska pararescueman, uh, we only have certain guys, certain amount of guys on the team. And when we flip flop for guys in Afghanistan to guys maintaining the Alaska alert, 
as soon as I came back from Afghanistan, I had like three or four days off and I'm right back on alert. And uh, there's no decompression. And I think at one of those days within the first week I was home, I was sitting on, and it, again, this is, you know, 11 years ago, but I was sitting on the couch. I'd been home from Afghanistan for, you know, like two or three days within that same week. And we were watching Forrest Gump. And we were watching Forrest Gump, that scene where it's raining and then it stops raining and then there's a the big firefight. And man, that hit me like a ton of bricks. And I just immediately started crying uncontrollably. And I went out into our garage and I laid on the garage floor, just like weeping like an, like an animal. And, and I was, that's when I knew something was wrong because Forrest Gump shouldn't do that to me, man. You know what I'm saying? So like, how many times <laughs> you see Forrest Gump, you know? And, and, and I was like, well, shit, you know, like what in me subconsciously is happening? And obviously it's just this immense black hole of grief that I was keeping at arm's distance, you know? I mean, there's times where I would, I would be driving home or I would listen to a song or something would happen. The wind would blow a certain direction. I would just take a knee and just start crying uncontrollably. Um, also, I mentioned my, my relationship with my younger son, Oz. Um, again, these are subconscious. It's like, a, it's like your conscious and subconscious are trying to like find value or just even make sense out of the things that have happened. And, uh, you know, having a son with special needs that's nonverbal with type one diabetes uh, is very difficult. And he's had that since the age of three. And uh, I remember uh, I, I would wake up. And so I, was, I didn't want to wake him up in the middle of the night. And I'd have to go and poke his finger and check his blood sugar in the middle of the night, like one in the morning. And uh and I, I would go there and I would, I would wake up just instinctively in the middle of the night. And so I was just dreaming, right? I was just in this dream state. I wake up and I put a, my headlamp on and I turn my headlamp on and it's a green headlamp because I don't want to wake up Oz, man, my son. So I, I sneak into his room and I turn on this green headlamp to poke his finger to check his blood sugar. And then as I would do that, uh, it would make me have these horrible flashbacks of being on NVGs in combat situations because of that green. And I'm in that weird subconscious state of where I was just sleeping. And then I began having these horrific nightmares of these combat uh, experiences that, I, that I've had. And when I would treat the men that, that, that I had treated, it was my two sons that I would treat. And, and these guys had horrific injuries, you know, like, uh, you know, disfiguring, you know, combat injuries uh, from missing the back of their head to, you know, uh, holes the size of grapefruits in the sides of their chest or their legs or appendages, angulated fractures or, or turned around backwards kind of stuff. And, and they're begging for their lives. And so to be stuck in this dream state when I would try to sleep and every time that I would visit that, those memories, it was my children that I'm seeing. So obviously my story is very, you know, uh, complicated because I've, I've done CPR on my son and I think that uh, traumatic situations are very interesting because we have like a hard drive in our subconscious. And every time that you are exposed to mortal threat, that starts recording. And so I've had many of those situations, you know, like first responders, uh, definitely tier one special operations guys like you, that hard drive, it's got a lot of gigs of information on it. You know what I'm saying? It's, it is swelling with content and those are all memories and thoughts that have never been unpacked or processed and so they become one linear thing and so the bulk of my career as a pararescueman once I recovered from my my horrific injuries uh, I was trying to save my son Oz so even when I was trying to save those men in Afghanistan throughout Bulldog Bite, I was trying to save Oz. And then when I come back and I'm trying to process those men dying so traumatically in my arms on the side of that hill as we're calling in airstrikes to martyr ourselves. When I try to process those events, it's my son's face. You know, it's like, those are some very tangled webs, man, you know, and, and, uh, uh, to make this story even more surreal or layered or complicated, I don't want to complicate 
uh, anything for the audience uh, that's listening to this. Uh, Bulldog Bite was uh, the operational name of the combat that, that I'm, I'm experiencing, that, I, that I'm kind of somewhat alluding to about this. But when we returned from that, that was an eight day period of the most surreal combat that I've ever experienced or I could ever imagine taking place. Like literally the, I find comfort in reading uh, World War I trench warfare literature to comfort me in my human emotional content of those thoughts and memories. Like when I read uh, All Quiet on the Western Front or when I uh, read other World War I trench warfare literature, you know, uh, beautiful poetry by Robert Service Frost. You know, I mean, like, uh, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just saying that to you, that it makes me realize that I'm okay, that, that what I, what I am experiencing subconsciously or emotionally is part of a normal human response to horrific trauma. And to read World War I literature that reflects my own thoughts is timeless, you know, and that, that's very powerful to me to be able to have kinship with the men that wrote that. And I think this is very powerful for the listeners. I do believe uh, absolutely that creativity is the way back to ourselves, that our creative, the gift of creativity, whether it's through verse and poetry or reading or writing, anything that's going to allow you to emote in a different medium that's expressive, painting, I don't care what it is, um, um, that is one of the most healing things uh, that is a gift to us in this world. And, and uh, uh, that took me a long time to come to that, but I almost came to it naturally after my experiences uh, to attempt to articulate them, uh, to attempt to express them in ways because, I mean, you know this as well as I do, and I know your listeners do as well. I mean, like our human experience goes beyond our our ability to articulate it. And that's where art, that's where art, that's why human beings have created art, you know, and, and I think that all of us that have experienced things that are powerful, we have very powerful things to reflect in response to that. And uh, so to go back to my story, uh, immediately after the events of Bulldog Bite, we flew back to our main base. And within 24 hours of those events that I'm, that are the most horrific of my life, three gentlemen were there and they knocked on our compound door and we're, you know, we are a very special operations unit within a compound, within a compound, within a compound. And these three gentlemen knocked on our door with a public affairs officer in uh, Bagram, Afghanistan, 24 hours after these horrific events. And they approached me about wanting to make a documentary about tattooing us. Now, listen, man, I, I mean, I, at the time I'd been in the military over 20 years, almost all of it in special operations. I'd seen, you know, uh, a plethora of combat and a lot of very weird, surreal situations. And I have never heard anything as weird as that. And the synchronicity of meeting those men at that moment, I was so vulnerable and so fragile and so decimated of grief and horror when I met those men, that is an inexplicable meeting. I, I cannot, that is weird stuff, man. And uh, Carl Jung is, is a famous philosopher from the 60s. And he said that when we have unprocessed events, the universe will project synchronicity. And I think that's a way of kind of articulating that we want to make sense out of this world that doesn't make any sense. Like, there has to be more to this world than random shit. Like there has to be a collective consciousness. And that's where, whether man has attempted to articulate and create God through religion, or maybe that's just us attempting to explain something that's inexplicable, but it's very real. And I was at such a profound state of euphoric horror when I met those men tattoos forced me to come back to myself like to have another human being tattoo me 
at that moment was one of the most cathartic things that could have ever happened. And so that artist that tattooed me, he's a, a you know, a very, very gifted, not only human being, but artist. Uh, his name is Scott Campbell. The guy that was making the documentary for Scott was a guy named uh, Casey Neistat. I mean, all these guys are icons within pop culture and larger artistic expressive culture now. But at the time, they were just these budding guys, but they were the muse to my horror. Like they were just these guys, and you can't explain them being there. It makes no rational sense. You know, I mean, talk to any special operations guy with my experience, and they'll tell you the same. Like that is really, really weird, man. And I did not take this as a sign from God, but I just, it was so powerful to be tattooed. And I just had my son's names tattooed on my chest with sparrows because I wanted, that's an old nautical tradition uh, within Western style tattooing because, you know, sparrows are a landlocked bird and it's a homecoming. And so I wanted to feel closer to the things that I love. And so I had my, my children's names with sparrows tattooed on my chest. And I also had Scott, because again, tattooing is interesting, you know, like all the guys got tattooed and Scott Campbell tattooed us in this vision quest, nonstop three-day period of just tattooing us. Because these were smart men, you know, Casey Neistat, there's another man, a man I, I didn't uh, introduce, his name was David Kuhn, and he's kind of like this international man of mystery. They, he got them there. They had basically fake press passes. They planes, trains, and automobiled themselves there to be at that moment. They were ready to give up on their quest to, to do this thing when the PA officer was like, hey, there's these guys called PJs. Uh, you might want to go check them out. And they had no idea that we were coming from the combat that we, were, that we had experienced. And, and again, the combat that we experienced is the most surreal that I could fathom human beings ever going through. And their project was to tattoo special operations guys right from combat. And so just the synchronicity of it all working was unlikely at best, but inexplicable in the way that it did happen. And these guys were smart. I mean, I think artists are very, if they're anything, they're, they're sensitive to the metaphysics of the things around. Maybe they're not consciously aware of it, but they are attuned to frequencies that aren't overt you know and I think that's what makes a good artist and uh, these guys were in tune and they they realized that we were coming from some very very horrific shit and they they I mean they would look at our uniforms and I mean our uniforms were covered in blood and brains and feces we hadn't showered in over an eight day period we really hadn't slept you know but maybe one or two hours every 24 hours so just animal to animal, they knew that that something was up, you know. <laughs> and I mean, to to mention, one of our guys had a giant uh, uh, stitches across his forehead where he had been shot in the head, and the bullet, the the fragment was embedded in his skull, and we sewed it shut over the the penetrating trauma because we needed him, and he didn't want to leave the team. You know what I'm saying? Like that's how horrific this stuff was, and and. Uh, we had a three day period and we were going right back out to go uh, do the same thing that we were just coming back from. So I thought that the documentary was a way, a nice way to capstone the humanity of what was taking place. And then it's almost proof of life. Like when I die a week from when you tattoo me, you're going to be able to show my family this film. And maybe my sons are going to be able to get that same tattoo, you know, and, and, uh, that's what it meant to me. But, you know, consciously, I wasn't aware of any of that shit. But subconsciously, I was just like, yeah, let's do the project, you know. Uh, that was uh, in 2010. You know, that was November of 2010. So here we are, you know, January, February, March, April 2022, you know, and it feels like it was last week that those things happened, you know. And I retired from the military. Uh, maybe four or five years ago. And it seems like I, the la my last day was yesterday, literally, you know, um, I think that's one of the, the difficulties of getting older as time speeds up as we age. You know, like whenever we were a kid, remember like being in kindergarten, when you recollect a kindergartner, kindergartner's day 
that's that's like a year of time to us as adults. You know, it's like, and as we're adults, like a year is a is a, is goes by in the blink of an eye. It really does, and I think that's because we accumulate so much experience that everything is really dulled over. Like all of those tastes and those sights and those experiences are very mulled over with monotony, and and it's. You know, I, I think that's the challenge of, of age is to not let that happen. And, and it just does. It's insidious, you know, with the more profound our experiences are, it just makes time accelerate dramatically, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, here we are, man. Uh, uh, as, I was as I was retiring, I started tattooing and Scott Campbell became a very, very uh, uh, intimate friend of mine. Uh, and very close mentor. And, and uh, uh, I mean, I think he, he feels very reluctant, you know, to put himself in that position because I am a little bit older than he is. And he's absolutely in awe of my life experience, I think. Um, I mean, he named his son Oz, you know, and, and uh, he and he and I have a very close relationship. And, and uh, he just tattooed my son Oz. If the listeners want to go to my my social media Instagram page, they can find Scott tattooing Oz when he turned 18. Uh, he tattooed Oz uh, a really cool skull on his on his inner arm, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm absolutely in love with the the dark metaphysical power of tattoos, and uh, you know, I guess being introduced to those. I mean, I, I had tattoos on me before. I mean, what military guy really doesn't have tattoos, especially guys that have been in for like 25 years and stuff. I mean, uh, a dear friend of mine before all this stuff happened was Oliver Peck. And he's the uh, he's a very famous tattoo artist. And I've known him for 25 years, something like that. And so, again, I mean, there's there's inexplicable things that happen to us, right? There's things that you just can't explain and they weave this really odd reality. Um, and I think though that those experiences are attracted to, or the grandeur of those experiences are attracted to how courageous you, you are willing to live your life. I think that, you know, doing things selflessly, and I guess to go back to that question, you know, what are powerful lessons that I've learned you know, I've, I've had a lot of time to think about this. And I was, I was very haunted with this after these experiences of that 2010 deployment. Um, I was asked to speak to a lot of special operations teams about the value of, of my experiences or what, what are the important things, right? Like, what are the things that really matter? And, and uh, I boiled all of these things down to two words, resolve and intention. And those two things within our lives, your resolve and your intentions can solve unsolvable problems in the face of overwhelming adversity. You can only face those with your resolve and your intentions. Like, you know, guys, again, the finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. Guys get so hung up on what weapon systems they're carrying, what kind of nerdy ass fucking gear they're wearing. In the, in the heat of the real shit, it doesn't matter. It's duct tape and trash bags. That's all you fucking need, man. You know, and, and these guys that want to be tacked to cool, you know, like they're wearing all the, the, the coolest shit, you know. I was that guy too, man. I get it, you know, and, and it's good to hone your craft. It really is. And ounces make pounds. And to, to understand the nuances of weapon systems or medical techniques or tactical, you know, techniques and and... I mean, believe me, I understand the value of that stuff. But in hindsight, the things that really, really matter are your resolve and your intentions. And don't let that finger pointing at the moon become the thing. You need to be focused on the moon, right? Like, why are you doing what you're doing? What are your intentions? Your subconscious intentions, not, you, not what you're going to tell me on a job interview. What, why subconsciously, what makes you wake up every day? In your resolve. Now, resolve is something that you have to train and that you have to develop through hardship. You know, and that's why doing difficult, uncomfortable things is so, so important in life. That's why it's important not to bulldoze or helicopter for your kids. 
they have to work the problem. There's another quote in, in Zen Buddhism. The obstacle is the way. I think that's a Stoic. It's not a, a Zen Buddhism, but there's a lot of overlap. You know, I mean, like wisdom is wisdom. But I think it was the Stoics that, that, that said that. The obstacle is the way. Let your kids work the problem. You, me, we need to work the problem. You know, the, the goal is not the solution. The, the goal is the strife and the difficulty. You know, that, that is how we develop our resolve. You know, whether you're a kid and, and you're going to lose your damn leg and you don't, your parents don't have health insurance, you don't even have an air conditioner, maybe you don't have a car, uh, you know, uh, whatever injustice you want to throw into there, that should harness and be the medium to develop your resolve. And that's why special operations, within special operations, it is, you know, the, the selection process is so arduous. It's because you're, you're, they're trying to test your resolve. That's what I was trying to do when I would do horrific things to students, to Rudy, to the other men that I've trained. You want to develop a medium to harness and strengthen your resolve. You know, and that's a very difficult thing because a lot of you know, newbies, what they end up doing is they just jump right into pride, right? They, they want, they, we identify with our suffering and they, they let pride take over immediately. And a good instructor is going to beat that shit out of you. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you want to, you want to own something and you want to have an ego because you, you felt pain and you felt pride in something that you belong to. Fuck that, man. Your training has only started. You're at level one there, grasshopper, and you need to keep getting your ass kicked to realize that, that that's just this innate reaction to pain is to identify with it. And, and so many people want to wear the t-shirt, man. They, they want to dress like a commando. They want to, like, you know, for yourself, like they want to, they want to be known as a firefighter. They want to be known as this thing. They want to be known as a special operations guy. They want to be known as a commando. And we would always joke, you know, it's like, you can dress like a commando in five minutes. You can go buy that shit online right now. All these airsoft guys, all these weirdos, you know, I mean, I'm sure you, there's a lot of them in the, the fire department <laughs> as well. You know, they want to just hang out and be a part of it because it's their ego. Yeah. But you need to be using that as a medium to develop yourself. And what's difficult is hang around long enough and be careful, brother, because you're going to get what you ask for, man. You know, if you want to be the man, like I always, I, I, I I'm, I'm very often asked to speak to graduating classes within special operations career fields. And I'm like, you know, everybody wants to be the man to you're the man. And when you're the man, it's a very difficult place because it's a grief machine. You know, when your job is to solve unsolvable problems or to meet people on the worst day of their life, you're going to inherit grief. If your job is to project violence in a way to solve problems, you're going to inherit grief. But you have to, again, don't let the finger pointing at the moon become the, the, the intention. The intention is to understand the moon, right? So use this as a medium to develop yourself. At some point, you're going to inherit so many experiences that they break you. That is the point of growth. That is the point that you need to let go of now your original intention and you need to find the middle ground. Get out of that career field. Change your identity. Go be an artist. Go work at a garden, man. Like go work at a giant garden for a year and just think about your experiences because you've, you've accumulated so much of a dichotomy, you know, that, 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 that of just grief and pain or just trying to perform at these highest levels. You're a human being. What makes you good is you think you can do anything, but that's where it's going to break you too. At some point, you need to realize that, that your strength is your vulnerability. You're connecting with your emotion. The thing that you've done your entire career that you've turned away from, now you need to connect to that. Like I remember there's the movie Cape Fear with uh, Robert De Niro. And uh, he's this, this, con that, that he basically killed his wife and it's, it's it's an old story it was redone it's it's a remake but uh he felt like he was dealt this injustice uh with uh the prosecution and his protective lawyer i don't want to get too into the story but the 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 lawyer 
who's Nick Nolte in, in the remake with uh, Robert De Niro, he's like, counselor. He's like, uh, you ever get raped by five bull queer? And, and, and he's like, uh, no, I haven't. He's like, well, you should. He's like, you need to get in touch with your feminine side. And, it, and so that's this extreme example, right? And I don't want to make light on anybody that's been raped or sodomized, but, but my point in this, this story is with extremes, you have to find dichotomy. You have to find dichotomy in our experiences and have the courage to let your experiences change you, okay? And, I, and again, I don't want to make light of anybody's trauma or you know, difficulties, but what, I'm, what I am trying to say is, is you have to find dichotomy from your experiences to learn from them. The most difficult thing I've seen is peers, like friends of mine that I've spent entire my art, entire adult lives with at the tip of the razor of the spear. And they won't let their experiences change. Them. Man, get out of the military, man. Get out of the military and go garden. Get out of the military and go join a conservation group. Get out of the military and just paint shit and sell it at a bazaar. Get out of the military and volunteer your time at a soup kitchen. Do something that is whatever you think the dichotomy of who you are, what you identify with, find whatever that is and do that. Because that way you can sail home to yourself. You know, like the, the, the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey, the, the, the beautiful Greek mythological story of Odysseus, right? Like that's taking too literally, right? Like, so people think like, you know, the story is Odysseus, they sack Troy. Uh, now, Odysseus has to come home, right? He needs trying to come home to his family and his castle, right? But along that way, he has to go through all these trials and tribulations. That is exactly what we experience as first responders or military members that have spent an entire career doing those things, it's specifically guys that see horrific trauma. Or, or have used violence to solve problems as a profession. That's exactly what Odysseus had experienced. And now he's trying to sail home to himself. And so he meets the Cyclops. The Cyclops is his ego, right? Uh, the, the, the siren song. The siren song is our attraction to violence or our identity of our ego, all these things. And so I would, I would challenge people to, 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 you know, read the Iliad and the Odyssey and read that as a proverbial thing of sailing home to yourself metaphorically, you know, because that's, that's what all of this is for. That's, that's, that's the whole purpose. And the, the reason it's so difficult for people is because they're misaligned with their intentions or their resolve is not hardened enough to seek through those intentions correctly because there, it was just an ego dance. You know, they're just running that ego dance. It's like, let go of the ego. That's the whole point of this, you know? And so you need to reframe your intentions. And so it really comes down to those two things. Our resolve and our intentions are the most powerful things in this world. And, and uh, when your back's against the wall, your equipment's going to fail you. You think that, that, that flip down touchscreen iPad that's going to call in airstrikes is going to save the day. Well, it might sometimes. But when you take an RPG five feet away and it rips it off your chest or you run out of tourniquets or you run out of uh, hyphen dressings to close chest wounds with or uh, when it goes to hand to hand fighting and those airstrikes that you're calling in on yourselves hasn't killed you. You know, the only thing you have is your, your resolve and your intention, and that will carry you through the rest of your life if you're lucky enough to survive your experiences and and. If we do it all correctly, it allows us to sail home. And, and we find that that tenderness, you know, is caused, is, is that, that, that cultivation, that pain. That's that chrysalis, that, that caterpillar and that butterfly kind of thing. And the universe needs you to emote and express, you know. There's a thing within Greek society when warriors would come back from combat, if a combat troop stood on the corner and started speaking his heart, the civilians had to stop and sit there and listen. And that's what I see a lot is being done with all these podcasts, you know, like, like the universe will find a way to express itself. And it's just trying to balance shit out. It's trying to, like the soul of the world is trying to reflect and express and emote itself. And it's doing that through us, through the people that have experienced trauma. It's, ex 
it's attempting to express that through our eyes and our hands and our hearts, that the people that have experienced those pains, the universe is trying to emote that. And, and we have a responsibility to do so. And, and uh, that's the beauty of it. And, and again, that, that goes back to, you know, the story never mattered. It's just the emotion. So when I'm tattooing a peony or some esoteric sleeve or back piece that someone wants, it's like none of the details matter. It's the emotion, like what is hidden and what's the, the hidden haunt in what I'm doing? Because the power of it is in me emoting my experience through a medium. You know, and that, that's, that's, the, that's the intention of it. That's, that's what life is here to do. And, and um, I think the greater the pain, the greater the emoting. You know, like you, without difficulty, without strife and without injustice, you would never have Martin Luther King, right? Like you would never have these great leaders that, that the world has created without difficulty. And at some point, the difficulties we face become the grandeur of our lives, right? Like, like, like I am talking and emoting my pain to the listeners right now. And that, that is the value of it. But it has to be projected. It has to find its way of getting into the world, into the universe, you know. And it's not straightforward. But again, if you're having difficulty with these things that we're talking about, you know, focus on your resolve and your intentions, like bring your awareness to your intentions, like why? And again, that's the lives, the social media and stuff is like, it's just the self-promoting, I kind of joked about it earlier, the self-licking ice cream cone. Like it, if it's just for self-promotion, who gives a shit that has no value? That, that's, that's junk food. The heart of the matter is the emotion. Like, what are you gaining from that? If it empowers you, great but it needs to empower you to emote, to connect at a real level, you know? And, and uh, man, that's all I got to say, Dave. You know, that's just like, <laughs> I mean, it's, I don't know what to say, but you know, it's like, it's just powerful to be able to speak through other people's work. You know, like I'm, I'm, you know, I know you've put a lot of work into your podcast and you take it very seriously. It's, it's an honor for me to, to be able to, you know, just throw up all over the, the listeners and you right now. And, and uh, you know, it's just the beginning. You know, that, that's the difficulty too, is like, you know, it's difficulty, right? You know, like everybody wants to be the man or woman until they're the, the man or woman. But, but uh, that's because the Greek, you know, Joseph Campbell knew it all along. It's like, do not be the hero. And I've talked to Rudy about this, right? Like, don't be, you don't, nobody, don't want to be, nobody wants to be the hero because the hero is doomed. Period. So you have to shrug that off. You have to allow the accolades to come, but you can't absorb them. You, 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 you have to, I'll absorb the accolades for the men that aren't here. If you want to thank me for my service and thank me for the grief that I've absorbed uh, by taking part in the things that I've taken part in, I, I just feel, I feel lucky that I'm alive. And I feel very thankful to get to tell the story of these sacred experiences, you know, and I think it's, it's, it's one of the most powerful experiences or stories that we can tell through our lives is our story of our pain and us finding purpose in our pain. And that's up for each individually to do, you know, we, we each have to find that and, and uh, just, you know, I guess as parting words for the audience is just, you know, in reflection, don't get hung up on the finger pointing at the moon. Like, keep keep your heart and your, your, your mind on the moon itself. Like, what is that intention? What is the purity of your efforts? Um, yeah. I wanted to, one of the things that I wanted to thank you for Um. And this is one of the reasons why I'm I'm going back and listening to to your book again, because I um, <clears throat> part part of your story, and you, and you say in your book that you don't have an explanation for it, but you, you removed a patch from a uniform, and. 
I, I don't know what came first, you being awarded the, the Silver Star or you meeting that soldier's family. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the people we're talking about is uh, uh, Jesse Snow was one of the men that died on the hill uh, and he was uh, shot in the back of the head. He was shot in the back of the head trying to uh, help another man named Carl Bilby. And he was shot in the back of the head as they were being overrun and it went hand hand fighting. And soon after that, we called in Hellfire missiles. We inserted and we called in Hellfire missiles on the actual casualty collection point. Um, I don't want to get, I don't want to digress too much into the weeds of the story because it becomes, a, not that I'm afraid to be emotional, but the fact that it's just, there's a lot of content there that we would have to unpack. Well, um, uh, but, but so, uh, he, he ended up dying and uh, part of the thing that we do, and, and again, this was such a horrific event that I was taking body armor off the dead and trying to shield the, the, the living with the body armor. And, and uh, what we'll do is I'll try to sterilize people and I take off uh, name tapes, I take off stuff out of their pockets, like personal stuff. And obviously later we turn that into mortuary affairs and because and, and, it's a big mess with body bags and stuff. And, Again, I don't want to digress too much, uh, but uh, for the context of the question that you're asking, uh, on one of these soldiers, uh, I, I took off a screaming eagle off of his arm in the midst of this combat, and uh, I put it with me, and I, I did this with a lot of the, the men that died that night, and uh, uh, later on, uh, upon coming back, and again, it was an eight day period. This was like in the middle of this eight day period. And, and I realized that I still had it in my pocket and I just kind of kept it in my pocket. And uh, I don't know why, but I, I just did. And I remember when I took it off, it seemed like this very not reverent moment. But again, it's like, you know, you're, you're fighting rage and fear and horror and, and every emotion at the highest level of intensity. And uh I mean, this 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 patch is covered with blood and and you know body matter. You know, I mean, this is this is very significant. I guess horrific stuff in the context that I I took it off of this this uh, amazing human being, and uh, um, I just kept it. And I don't I don't understand why, but it was this reverent, peaceful moment of just horror. Again, this dichotomy stuff comes up, but. Uh, I held on to that, and it was uh, far uh, before I received the the, the silver star. The, the, those awards at that level, like anything above a bronze star, is highly political in the military, and it takes a very long time. And if anybody's listening to this and they've dealt with the the difficulties of receiving those awards, at some point you don't even care. Like you know, what I'm saying it because again, the you have more important shit to think about than the severity of an award that someone's going to give you. But it's difficulty because it's validating the severity of the intense horror that lives inside your mind of these experiences. Like it's validating in this way, but at the same time, it, it's, it's a false prophet. Like it's just, it's a political thing, you know? And, uh, it takes a very long time. I think it had taken like two, three years, maybe longer to receive that. But uh, during this time, I was experiencing horrible grief. I kind of alluded to earlier in our conversation. Um, I had to fly to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to be seen by the head military head shrinkers, like the psychotherapists, of the military, to get put back on status. Because I was self-identifying as, listen, man, I, I want to murder suicide my family. And uh, just because I'm so troubled with these thoughts and, and experiences that I have. And so that's a very difficult thing. And again, I'm happy to get into it, but uh, I think it would take away from you asking me the question. So again, well, this, is this is unexplainable. This is, I, I, I don't want to lose this train of thought right here. So okay. uh, the, uh, I was asked to go to Wright Patterson to speak to the head psychologist within the Department of Defense. And they were going to make a determination whether to med board me for PTSD or reinstate me as a pararescuman. And so I was going to fly to Wright Patterson. And around that same time, within the same week of this taking place, I got reached, uh, 
someone reached out to me on Facebook and it was the father of the man that I had taken that patch from. He's like, at the time I didn't know it, he was just like, hey, thank you for bringing my son's body home. And this was like a, a direct message over social media. And I even had to be like, well, what wounds did your son die of? He was like, my son was shot in the back of the head. And then I immediately knew who he was. And when that happened, it I was just horrified to speak to the next of kin, to be honest. You know, like I was just horrified because now I'm confronting the gravity of grief and emotion. And we need to validate that to each other. And so that's a very difficult thing to tread into. Um, and at the time, I was just just animalistically scared to meet his family. And uh, anyway, so I, I went home and I realized that I had to give that patch to them. And then I was like, in some weird way, I was like, maybe this is why all this has taken place, that I can make his family feel closer to him in those moments. And then I struggled with, maybe I should clean it up. You know, maybe I should clean off all the blood and stuff from the patch, you know? And I was like, no, I was like, no, fuck no. Like they, I owe them the truth. Like I owe them the reality of this. And so I just put it as raw and gritty and uh, brutal as that patch was just in a frame. And uh, it was funny because I was meeting with these psychologists and psychotherapists all day. And they, I did a battery of tests with these guys. And that night I was meeting that family for the first time. And, and, uh, they, and so I'm talking about all this stuff with these guys, the events of Bulldog Bite with the, these therapists. And again, this is an evaluation. So I'm taking SATs, I'm taking cognitive tests. And at the end of it, the end of this very long, mentally and, and, and emotionally taxing day, these guys are like, so what are you doing tonight? I was like, I'm meeting with the family of one of those men I was telling you about. And they're just like, holy shit, man. Like the grab and, and their reaction kind of made me realize of just this very sacred, reverent, amplified space that I'm in. And I don't know how I'm attracting this or why I'm in this space, but I have to meet this with my reverence and my intention. And, and, uh, it was it was very challenging to find their house and park and walk in. And they made this amazing meal for me, spaghetti and manicotti and wine. And uh, that was very powerful. It was like meeting God. It was it was like having dinner with God, you know, and uh, yeah, just uh, beyond emotional articulation, beyond it was just just one of those powerful events that, that uh, of grace and gratitude and synchronicity and life circumstances. Uh, but I know that, you know, me giving that patch to the family, the, the Snow family, uh, Jesse and, and, and his wife, giving that patch to them was powerfully cathartic in ways that, you know, words, words really fall short of. And but I can't explain taking that patch to then give that to them as much as I can explain Scott tattooing us after those events. Um, it, it's, it's, that's the spooky mystery of life stuff, man. And, and uh, it's, I, I, I've spoken with many therapists along the way and there was uh, one woman uh, who was a therapist and she's a very well noted uh, special operations therapist for operators. And I was at this retreat with her and, and she was speaking with me and she was like, I've never met anyone so unwilling to accept mercy, love or grace in their life. She's like, you take the cake, man. And uh, I think that those moments with the Snow family even those moments uh, with their son on the side of that hill in Afghanistan in such horrible circumstances like that is grace. I think that, you know, you know, even uh, performing CPR on my son and then the love that we share right now, 
the love that I share with my older son, who's an uh, infantryman in the Marine Corps right now, like that is grace. And that is present in every one of our lives. And we're just too dumb to see it. We're too dumb to experience it, or we're unwilling to, to experience life with courage to have that available to us, you know, and, and, uh, You know, again, it's just it's it goes beyond articulation. But um, uh, the book, you know, like even the book, Dave, like I didn't try to write that book. Uh, a dear friend of mine, the, the man that I mentioned, uh, we sewed the, the 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 bullet fragmentation into his skull. Uh, he was dear friends with an author and they wrote a book and I was that young special operations uh troop I was his mentor on that deployment I was his like uh sugar daddy on that deployment I was his NCOIC and and uh in writing his life story I came to know the the co-author as well as the public uh the publishing agency in Macmillan Press and and uh as I retired they, they were like we want to write a book about your life we want you to write a book and and I was it came at the right time because I really needed perspective you know, and, and, uh, but on that, the cover art was, uh, was created by Scott Campbell, the tattoo artist. And on that patch is, uh, mercy, love, and grace, you know, it represents mercy, love, and grace. And so, you know, I challenge all the listeners to go check that out. Uh, I don't want to do any, uh, 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 self-publicity in this, but if, if listeners are going to buy the book, please go to uh, goruck.com. I'm a cadre for a company called Goruck and they are selling the book there. And all proceeds that go to that go to uh, my son, Oz. It goes to his special needs trust. So if you go and buy the audio, you can get it on iTunes and everything. Uh, if you want to hear me talk, go and do that. But please buy the book on Goruck, uh, the Goruck website. If you just search Warriors Creed and the GoRuck website or just look around on it, you'll find it. All the, the money that uh, we generate from that goes to my son, Oz. It goes to his special needs trust. So uh, it ensures his because I'm not going to live forever, man. You know, none of us. I think it's the hard thing as far as parents and anybody with special needs parents. I think they'll understand. I mean, that's the difficulty. Like we want to empower our children to carry our energy and our fire into the world and to have a special needs uh child it uh it makes that a little more challenging and so i'm trying to take all of this chronic metaphysical energy even if it's in monetary funds to put into a trust for him that you know he can keep the dream alive after i'm long gone you know so uh not to guilt trip anybody but please if, if you want to buy the book buy it from go ruck and, and that money will go right to to oz that'll be the link that i put in the show notes uh to be you know, they'll, I'll, I'll find it for them so they can. Yeah, just a hot link. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, <clears throat> that's just recently. Uh, I've been working a couple of years for a company called GoRuck, and that company bridges the gap of special operations guys and civilians with really arduous, like physical events, kind of like the the Spartan races and and these other things. It's it's just kind of like another version of that, but it's all very flavored from special operations selection and training and and uh, uh, but. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, again, Dave, is there anything else you wanted to talk about, man? Well, I, I know you got to go. I, d I just, the thing that I wanted to thank you for was, so that bit of your story about the patch, that was one of the times that it, it hit me hard and I had to pull over. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the way that I processed that in my head was and, and in the book you know understanding uh it, it's not blatant or like in your face but you can tell that the the award wasn't all that important to you yeah and giving that patch to that family was and how powerful that was um, to me 
it, it was just it was fucking beautiful man and um I, I feel like that was uh how you were honored yeah man that's that's really heavy to think about dave and it, it's really because you know I've done a lot of podcasts and this one I feel is probably one of the most powerful ones. And it's just, maybe it's taken me time to gain perspective, you know, over time, but that's, that's really heavy for you to lay on me like that. I've never, ever, and I've, 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 I thought about it subconsciously, it's really hitting home now, but I've never thought of it in those regards. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for that. That's, uh, that, that's extremely powerful to think in, in that context, you know, um, and that, that's deeply insightful. Uh, I've never, I've never thought of those things in that. And I mean, sometimes these, these experiences are so powerful. I just, despite me trying to unpack them, there's just, there's so much to unpack. And, and I've never thought about those moments in, in that regard. Um, you know, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, it's just as time goes on, if we, if we live courageously, I think that catharsis happens. You know, like, like I've connected with many, many of the men that, that survived the ground combat of Bulldog Bite now. And it, it's hard, right? Because like we all see things from our perspective. Like, like you can say like there was, you know, five RPGs that detonated, you know, within 10 feet of me, or, you know, you can just start doing all these things. And, and again, it, none of that matters. It's the emotion, right? It's like, it's, it's connecting with each other in these emotions. And I just feel so profoundly grateful to be able to share my story and to connect with these other survivors like this. And, and, uh, um, but uh, yeah, thank you for for that, I mean, that, that again, coming back to just that, that analogy of the gift of being able to do that for them. Uh, it was hard, too. I mean, I remember just sitting in the rental car outside of their house and they're like, all right, here we go. You know, and, and we did another thing. We did a Bulldog Bite Memorial Go Ruck event where many of the survivors came out. And uh, including the pilot and many of the ground uh, infantrymen that were on the ground experiencing th this very, very surreal combat. And, and uh, for all of us to be together, it's, it's like that communion should have took place 10 years ago. And uh, it just takes time, man. But there's all this stuff that's coming out. Like there's, there's other authors that are writing about those events now. And, and uh, it's just, uh, it's beautiful to see it as time goes on. But um, you know, I think that our traumas, we have to, we have to emote them, we have to express them, whatever they are, you know, and, and uh, the universe wants that, you know, the universe really wants those things, God, the universe, whatever you want to call it, it wants those things to express themselves. Uh, and the only cost to us is having courage and allowing those things to change us. And, and uh, uh, yeah, thanks again, Dave, thanks for having me on, man. And, and uh, uh, you know, I just, I wish you the best of luck with what you're doing. I could, I could feel uh, the intention that you have with, with what you're doing. And, and thank you for reaching out to me through Rudy. Uh, and uh, I hope to get you connected uh, with your expertise and maybe find you some catharsis through some force blue diving, but uh, uh, yeah, all that's to come. And, uh, but uh, yeah, just the beginning, bud. Thank you so much. I, I really am honored to to be able to have this time with you. And uh, I really, really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Um, resolve and intention and, uh, you know, the finger pointing at the moon. Um, I, and just your story, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, man, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. My goal is and always will be to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, 
please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them, and the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.